Welcome everyone. I'm Ed Remus, the Social Sciences Librarian at Northeastern Illinois University. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries, the NEIU History Department, and the NEIU Political Science Department, I'd like to welcome our speakers and our audience to this discussion. This is the first event in a new and ongoing panel discussion series titled Perspectives on the Constitution. Through August of this year, this series is made possible with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which is an initiative of the American Library Association. Uh, um, we are grateful for their support. Uh, we also depend on your support to sustain events such as these. At the close of this event, you'll be sent an online survey to get your feedback, and we hope that you will fill it out. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. William Adler, who will be introducing the topic and the speakers for our discussion. Dr. Adler is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science here at Northeastern, where he teaches classes on a range of topics related to American politics. He has authored over a dozen scholarly articles on topics ranging from American political development to the Trump presidency, and he also contributes frequently to popular media outlets like NBC News and WGN. So thank you, Dr. Adler, for moderating our event today. Thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you for organizing and putting together this panel and the wonderful series uh, that you were speaking of. Uh, I will briefly introduce each uh, of our panelists and uh, then give them some opportunity to say a few words for about uh, 10 to 12 minutes each. Following that, we'll let each of the panelists respond to each other. And then uh, once we've gone through that, we'll uh, hopefully open the floor for some Q&A with, uh, with our audience. So I'll introduce the panelists in the order in which uh, they'll be speaking today, starting first with Ira Katz Nelson. Uh, Ira Katz Nelson is Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University. His book, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, was awarded the Bancroft Prize in History and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation <laughs> Award in Political Science. Professor Katz Nelson's most recent book is Southern Nation, Congress and White Supremacy After Reconstruction with David Bateman and John Lipinski. He has also served as Pitt Professor of American History at the University of Cambridge and as president of the Social Science Research Council, the American Political Science Association, and the Social Science History Association. Up next is Julia Azari. Julia Azari is Associate Professor and Assistant Chair in the Department of Political Science at Marquette University. She holds her PhD from, the, from Yale University and her BA from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her research and teaching interests include the American presidency, American political parties, the politics of the American state. And her research has been supported by uh, a variety of foundations, including the Harry Middleton Fellowship in Presidential Studies, the Gerald Ford Presidential Library, Travel Grant, and the Harry Truman Library Institute. She's a regular contributor to the political science blog, The Mischiefs of Faction, and her work has also appeared in many other locations, including 538. And her book uh, on the changing politics of the presidential mandate was published by Cornell University Press in 2014. Our third panelist today is Gary Lawson. Gary Lawson came to Boston University after 11 years uh, at Northwestern University School of Law. He was named the Philip S. Beck Professor of Law in 2012. He has authored nine editions of a textbook on administrative law and has co-authored a textbook on constitutional law. He has authored or co-authored nearly 100 scholarly articles and five university press books on topics ranging from aspects of constitutional theory and history to the proof of legal propositions, and his work has been cited in 16 opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court. He is a founding member and serves on the board of directors of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Professor Lawson twice clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia at the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and then at the United States Supreme Court. So uh, we have a very distinguished panel and I will now turn it over to Ira Katz Nelson to begin our conversation today. Thank you so much, um, William. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and thanks Ed for playing such a key role in uh, galvanizing uh, this uh, conversation about Congress and the separation of powers. Um, we don't have the time for me to tell my Justice Scalia story, except to note that when I taught once at the University of Chicago and he was at the law school there, we, we both had uh, uh, children of roughly the same age. And each time uh, uh, Scalia had, Professor Scalia had a, um, 
a child ready for nursery school. So did the Katz Nelsons. And we shared carpooling together and had, let's just say, vigorous conversation. Um, so uh, he's much missed, uh, certainly intellectually and humanly. Um, the, the subtitle of this event speaks of differing perspectives. I think of what I'm about to say is less as differing and more as complementary. Um, scholars of Congress are presently focusing heavily on questions of party polarization, legislative productivity, interbranch bargaining, uh, each an aspect of as cause or effect on how the constitutional separation of powers proceeds, especially between the executive and legislative um, branches. And these matters will be front and center in our uh, forthcoming discussion. But I'd like to enter this zone of consideration, as it were, by the side door of a particular policy advantage. My remarks will ask us to think about Congress and the separation of powers from the vantage of the policy content of lawmaking, lawmaking concerning national security. In that context, uh, jumping off from Robert Dahl's early 1950s work on Congress and foreign policy and the implications of atomic energy, I'll focus on Congress and national security and questions of exception, delegation, and deference to executive power. And we'll see that the dynamics of legislative productivity and the impact of polarization have been distinctive in this arena of public affairs. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, my comments are premised on a simple observation about studies of Congress. As students of Congress, we frequently pay insufficient attention, I think, to what might be called the substance of representation, not just party or preference or institutional rules or strategic calculations, the stuff of congressional analysis, but the content of lawmaking can shape and transform each of those causal elements. And from the late 1940s through the early 1980s, this premise about the importance of content uh, underpinned the work of such leading scholars as Dio Key and Dahl, um, Gabriel Almond, Barbara Sinclair, Augie Clausen, and then young David Mayhew, who became the leading Congress scholar of our time. But in the decades since, since the 80s, content has given way to process and strategy in congressional analysis. And I'd like to bring content back in. Now, my remarks on Congress and national security sit in a, in a field of tension that's very old, um, certainly was identified by John Locke uh, three and a half centuries ago, nearly in his second uh, treatise. In chapter 11 on the extent of legislative power, he wrote, the, I quote, the first and fundamental positive law of all commonwealths is establishing the legislative power. This legislative is not only the supreme power of the commonwealth, but sacred and unalterable in the hands where the community have once placed it, nor can any edict of anybody else in whatever form or by whatever power back have the force and obligation of a law which has not a sanction from that legislative which the public has chosen and appointed for without this, the law could not have that which is absolutely necessary to it becoming and being a law. But then there's also Locke of chapter 14 of the second treatise, the chapter on prerogative powers, of powers of the executive. Um, and he wrote, where the legislative and executive power are in distinct hands, there the good of society requires that several things should be left to the discretion of him, in that case, the king, who has the executive power for the legislators not being able to foresee and provide by law for all that may be useful to the community. And he goes on and says, many things there are which the law can by no means provide for. 
and these must necessarily be left to the discretion of executive power to be ordered by executive power as the public good and advantage shall require. And I won't keep reading, um, but uh, there is an inherent tension there. Um, Congress, the supreme power of a good republic, um, but there's a zone of activity um, where Locke tells us uh, the legislature cannot act with necessary speed, um, discretion, uh, vigor uh, to protect the common um, wheel. And this tension repeats itself in the American founding, certainly in tensions um, and ambiguities uh, um, that concern how we read Article 1 and Article 2 of the Constitution on congressional and presidential powers. Um, in selling the Constitution, it was Hamilton who wrote in Federalist 23 that there should be, and I quote, no constitutional shackles under conditions, uh, that's end quote, under conditions of security emergency, what he called security exigencies. Now, I'm not going to linger on the uh, 17th or 18th or uh, centuries, but rather um, uh, more recent past. And my concerns, both empirical and normative, are captured in an article, a very short article, only six pages long, that Robert Dahl wrote in 1953 that he called Atomic Energy and the Democratic Process. And two years earlier, he had published a, a report, a little over 100 pages, with a law school colleague at Yale, Ralph Brown, called The Domestic Control of Atomic Energy, that closed with a series of problems of what they call general theoretical significance. And these included the effects of secrecy on the democratic process, the relationship of lay citizens to experts, and the role of small groups of leaders in the making of key decisions in American democracy. Dahl and Brown asked whether and how the leaders in this substantive arena of atomic energy and national security, quote, could be controlled. He asked, they, they asked whether they could be controlled by traditional democratic institutions. And they were concerned to identify, quote, effective limits to their discretion. And then the short 1953 article followed called The Impact of Atomic Energy that sought to assess whether it could be possible, and I quote, to deal with atomic energy through democratic political processes, especially Congress about which Dahl had just published his first book on Congress and foreign policy. And the article noted with alarm that in the atomic age, in this area of public affairs, quote, the political processes of democracy do not, and he italicized not, do not operate effectively. Atomic policy, Dahl concluded, and I quote, will remain the product of a tiny group of leaders in all the choices on offer which defy wide public understanding and control had become a kind of indigestible element in the operation of American democratic politics, an indigestible operation in the operation of American politics. Now, among other matters, and I'll try to go uh, speed up a bit, um, Dahl had in mind the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 which was the most remarkable act of congressional delegation, at least until that date in US history, ceding complete control over the most vital area of security, including the right to drop the bomb on one person, the president, together with oversight and full control in the executive branch of a large and growing part of industry and the economy. No markets here, but um, state planning. Now, this exceptional zone soon expanded. The 1949 amendments to the National Security Act of 1947 exempted the CIA from ordinary reporting responsibilities to Congress for its expenditures and activities. Concern with subversion, the Internal Security Act of 1950, passed over Truman's uh, veto, created for the first time a group of citizens to be treated distinctively with regard to their freedom association 
and freedom of speech. I could go on, but Seoul began a long history, now extending more than seven decades of lawmaking for permanent exceptions regarding atomic weapons, geopolitics, internal security. By proclamation or delegation, power was centralized in the executive, Congress became secondary with limited oversight, courts in the main were bypassed, and the number of persons involved in key decisions sharply restricted, as was open debate and transparency. Emergency laws tended to become baselines for new laws and new emergency declarations. The country experienced a new permanent condition that came to full flower and became a source of articulated concern, not least by the president during the eight Eisenhower years. In short, we developed what might be called a dual state in which the national security part um, was very different, operated by very different processes than the, the, the other parts of the national state, uh, including the relations between Congress and the administrative um, executive branch. Now, finally, time beckons. So let me jump to the post 9-11 world. At a time of partisan polarization, when partisan polarization is widely thought to be the cause of reduced legislative productivity, Congress has been uncommonly active in passing, among others, and I'm not going to list all of them, the Patriot Act 2001, Homeland Security Act, 2002 and three, the Intelligence Reform and Prevention of Security Act, Protect America Act, FISA Amendments Act, Patriot Sunsets Extension Act, USA Freedom Act, 2015, and more. In all, more than 120 pieces of relevant legislation, some 50 that are significant by familiar scholarly measures, and almost all entailing unprecedented delegation to the executive um, have passed in a period when we're told by the mainstream literature, uh, congressional productivity is way down. Uh, last, let me close by simply saying that I'm currently doing an empirical analysis of these legislative pieces. And one of the most striking things, at least to me so far, uh, in looking and eyeballing the data is that neither um, the so-called first right-left dimension, nor the so-called second dimension of culture, region, race, um, shape roll call voting, the so-called cutting lines of roll call voting, um, or even the presence or absence of partisanship um, in this area of uh, lawmaking. So substance really matters. And um, I'm hoping in conversation we'll come back to lock and the tensions between legislative and prerogative power because we're living them every day. And if I be permitted one last paragraph to quote Hamilton, um, Federalist 26. It, this is a, a kind of normative more than empirical claim. It was a thing hardly to be expected, Hamilton wrote, that in a popular revolution, the minds of men should stop at that happy mean which marks the salutary boundary <laughs> between power and privilege and combines the energy of government with the security of rights. A failure in this delicate and important point, that is to find the balance between the energy of government with the security of rights, a failure in this delicate and important point is a great source of the inconveniences we experience, that is at the end of the revolutionary period. And if we are not cautious to avoid a repetition of the error in our future attempts to rectify and ameliorate our system, we may travel from one chimerical project to another. We may try change after change, but we shall never be likely to make any material change for the better. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for those comments. Uh, very enlightening, a lot to, lot to talk about there, a lot to digest. Uh, but before we get to that, I will turn it over to our second panelist today, uh, Julia Azari, and give her some time for her remarks as well.
Okay, great. Thank you, William. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for including me on this really distinguished panel. What I want to talk about today is a little bit of comparison between the current administration and the previous one. Um, and I, I want to kind of riff on what I think has become a common piece of conventional wisdom, which is that Trump had a really profound kind of hold on the GOP. And not to start my remarks by promoting my own work, but I have a piece uh, that went up at 538 yesterday about Trump and, and the GOP and kind of how Trumpism uh, looks in this moment. And, you know, in contrast, that the story of the Biden presidency has been a lot of struggles with his own party um, and of pushback and conflict with both the kind of what I'll call, what we can call the centrist flank um, and also the left flank. So I wanna explore this question of what the difference is. Um, and I, I have three kind of ways of thinking about this question. The first one is more structural um, it has to do with the nature of the, the two parties' coalitions and values. The second one is, is rooted in, in the immediate electoral context. And the third one is, I think, really to challenge the premise of my own question and suggest that maybe they're not that different after all. Um, but I, I want to start with the kind of scope of the, of the problem. We've known for a long time, and to speak to some of the, the classic themes in mid-20th century political science that, that Ira was referring to this idea that Congress and the president operate separately, they have to legislate together. Um, this is a really, I think, very common animating theme in thinking about mostly domestic, but even to some extent foreign policy interbranch relations and policy making. Um, the logic behind this is Congress and the president operate according to different political incentives, and they can check each other as a result and often find themselves not on the same page. I think Richard Neustadt, a presidential scholar writing at the middle of the 20th century, put this in a really pithy way when he said, what the Constitution separates, our parties do not combine. And I thought about that quotation a lot during the four years Trump was president because there were so many moments in which it seemed like that was no longer true. And again, we get to this, this contemporary moment with Joe Biden, and all of a sudden it seems like actually there are members of the Democratic Party who have very distinct prerogatives, very distinct incentives from President Biden. So I'm gonna try and break down why is this? And I'll start with the structural kinds of explanations. This really gets, I think, deeply into some bigger questions in political science, some that William and I have actually worked on in our work together, um, which is whether there's a fundamental asymmetry in the two parties' coalitions. And here, I think that there, there is potentially something going on in the Republican and Democratic coalitions that are quite different. This builds here on some of Liliana Mason's work on the idea of identity and how much identity drives American politics. And this idea that really wielding power um, requires that you build a coalition of people who are convinced that you're wielding it on their behalf and not against them, that power is not being wielded over them. I think this is easier for Republicans and Democrats. And here, I'm again, building on some work by Mason, some of the, the foundational work on asymmetry, but basically Republican presidents can make claims about the nature of their coalition and whose behalf they're working on that can consolidate around really critical pieces of identity, specifically race and broadly speaking, religious identity, um, that the Republican coalition is not entirely homogeneous, but is much more so than the Democratic coalition. Also, the, the original kind of theory of asymmetry that Hopkins and Grossman work suggests that Republicans are more ideological than Democrats. I don't know if I fully believe that, but I think that Republicans maybe are more uniformly conservative and more uniformly identify conservatism with some key principles, um, and that Democrats see their ideologies as meaning wildly different things. And the Democratic coalition is much more diverse. And it's much easier, I think, for someone within the Democratic Party, say a president, to wield power in ways that are received by members of that coalition as wielding power over them. I, I think this is, I think maybe sort of a provocative claim, but I want to, I want to throw it out there, which is that, that the racial tensions of American politics are very much present within the democratic coalition. I think you see that with some of the anti-squad rhetoric, um, some of the elements of the democratic coalition that are 
that are pushing back against the power of these kind of this new branch of um, of legislators that are not only very liberal in their views on economics, but also on policing, many of whom are people of color, women of color, younger people. Um, I think that within the Democratic coalition, there's some tension in which folks who don't belong to those groups who don't identify with them don't want to feel like those groups are wielding power over them. I think that also works in reverse. I think that there's enough power and strength within those segments of the Democratic coalition that Biden also can't wield power in the same way over, um, uh, you know, on behalf of members of the Democratic Party who belong to more dominant groups um, who are or who are more centrist. So I think that there's a lot more possibility in the Democratic coalition for people to have the sense that power is being wielded over them, even when it's being wielded by people who share their partisan identity. I think there's a, a different structural thing going on as well. This became really clear to me last week as I was teaching uh, the Obama presidency and kind of teaching um, the ideas that the Obama administration went in with as far as unilateral presidential power. And this speaks, I think, to some of Iris' points about national security, which is that national security and presidential power became kind of culture war topic in the Bush presidency and Democrats in a way that I don't think they really did before really started to identify unilateral power as a sort of a conservative idea. And this gets tied up then by both sides in, in culture war ideas of this, a strong presidency is kind of tied up with visions of masculinity. You're seeing this now um, as Biden is criticized for being too weak on some of the international issues that we're, that we're facing. But I think for Democrats, it's really unclear, you know, how the president is supposed to wield power in the coalition. This idea of consolidating the power in the presidency is, I think, has become really um, challenging for Democrats to, to embrace. Um, so I think that there are structural elements to, to both party coalitions that make it kind of a fundamentally different exercise. And I, I want to sort of pose questions about do is dealing with their own party in Congress, even under conditions of unified government, is this a fundamentally different enterprise for Republican and Democratic presidents that we would expect to see with different proper names in place, Trump or, or Biden. Having, having laid out some of the, the structural explanations, I want to also think about the particulars of these situations. And I think there are particulars in the elections of 2016 and 2020 that might also explain what we're seeing. Um, the, first, the first thing is something that I think we kind of don't talk about because the story of 2020 very quickly went from, oh my God, there's 19 Democrats on the, on the debate stage, half of whom most people have never heard of to there's a pandemic and that obviously was a much more impactful and important story but those two stories intersect and what happened is you get a very unfinished primary as the democratic coalition essentially consolidates in early march of 2020 around biden and then it's biden and and sanders as the last two candidates standing and then everyone's kind of on something else and so there's a very very fast and a kind of um, glossing over a lot of fundamental issues uh, process. And so I like to think of the 2020 primary as an unfinished primary that did not lay out much of a roadmap for how, how Biden would relate to the different elements of his party. I think Biden was able to get the nomination in part by appealing to powerful constituencies like African-Americans, particularly older African-Americans, um, but also pulling off some ideological ambiguity. And then, and I think that's a really effective election strategy, but then it leads you with a lot of questions about how to govern. So I think that's part of what's going on on the Democratic side. The other side is, is a straight up uh, kind of election interpretation and mandate story. Um, I think we're still in a world in which, although Trump did not win the popular vote in 2016, the very surprising nature of his presidency made that election and its interpretation really impactful. And directed a lot of attention toward, you know, what did the 2016 election mean? What were voters trying to tell us? And that really gave, I think, Trump some, some intra-party clout um, and some ability to set the party's agenda. Biden, on the other hand, underperformed 2020 predictions. The Democrats lost seats in the House. And the hoopla and circus following the 2020 election, I think, were, was also a strategy to distract from any kind of mandate claiming, and I think it worked. 
Um, so I think that there's much less of a sense that of Biden coming in with a kind of clear and agenda defining political capital with a kind of sense that Biden was elected for a reason that the electorate was, was trying to, to, to use my own book title, use, uh, to deliver a message um, other than maybe that people didn't want any more Trump. So I think that there is something in the story of both the nomination and the general election that might explain some of these differences. Um, I'm, I'm running low on time, but I do want to kind of lay out the, the possibility that, in fact, this isn't the right question. I don't always give remarks where I ask a question and then and then point out that it might be, maybe it's the wrong one. Um, I think the phenomenon I'm talking about is real, but I also think that that Trump's hold on the Republican Party was a very particular kind of hold. So on the one hand, let's read my piece, 538, um, almost every Republican now in elected office or seeking elected office is to position themselves relative to Trumpism. And most are opting to position themselves in a, in a more kind of positive way, interpreting Trumpism um, through one lens or another. But he also was not terribly successful at actually shaping the congressional agenda in a positive way. And actors like um, like Paul Ryan, like Mitch McConnell, and later Kevin McCarthy in the House, simply kept a lot of Trump's key items off of the, the legislative agenda. Um, so many of his priorities didn't become reality. So I think that that's, that's a key sort of thing to think about is are Republican and Democratic presidents engaged in a different enterprise entirely? Is there a, a situation in which presidents from one party can make a lot of politics around kind of owning the other side, symbolic rhetoric um, and executive action. Whereas, you know, from the other party, there's a lot of pressure to pass legislation and, and not a lot of sort of um, parallel tools that make it easier for them to work with their own parties and pass legislation. So I wanna close by saying that I'm, I'm working in this space right now as someone who studies the president party relationship um, where Biden's relationship to the Democratic coalition, to me, is just a really big question mark. Um, Biden has been a fairly quiet president rhetorically. Um, the symbolic elements of his presidency are quite different from his predecessor, Obama, are quite different from Trump. Will there be other presidents like him? Um, should we expect there to be a totally different kind of president <coughs> to win the next presidential nomination? Um, and I think my throat is trying to tell me that it's time to shut up. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Julia. I uh, hope you recover there, uh, get some water or something. Um, and thank you for those insightful remarks. And uh, again, a lot to chew on and a lot to think about. Uh, I'll now turn it over to our third panelist for the day, Gary Lawson. Thank you. And I, I want to echo everybody's thanks uh, to, to, to you, uh, Professor Adler, and, 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 and to you, uh, Ed, for putting this together and for including me. I, those old enough to remember the Miller Lite, Marv Throneberry commercials, uh, I, I do feel a bit like, uh, like Marv Throneberry. I'm not sure why he invited me to this. Uh, I approach Congress uh, not from the standpoint of political science, but as a constitutional theorist. And in legal theory, uh, surprisingly little attention gets paid to the constitutional role of Congress compared to the attention lavished on the presidency and the federal courts. It's a widely observed phenomenon, and it's an odd one, uh, given Congress's role in the constitutional scheme. It's not as though there aren't things to talk about. There are at least three broad categories, constitutional questions surrounding Congress. Uh, first, there are questions about the nature or composition of Congress. Uh, how is it structured? Uh, how are its members selected? Now, it's true that the Constitution provides reasonably specific answers to a lot of those questions and at least gives a framework for most of the others. So maybe you can understand why that would not be an attractive topic for legal scholars who are looking for flashy things to impress student law review editors. Uh, Yes, the legal journals are mostly edited by students. Uh, that explains a lot about legal scholarship. Uh, second, there are issues about the role or function of Congress. What exactly are the powers that it has? That one sees a bit more action, not a whole lot more, but a bit more. Uh, more so in the last quarter century, since the Supreme Court rediscovered the idea 
of enumerated powers in 1995 after 60 years of trying to bury it. Uh, but even then, the case law is very thin. The, the cases that have come up are, are on the fringes of congressional power, things like federal control over local crimes, not things like federal power over manufacturing or agriculture or insurance. 100 years ago, those all would have been hot topics. Uh, those are, those are non-starters uh, doctrinally uh, in, the, in the modern world. And the legal scholarship on this is, is mostly an attempt to rebury even the minor issues, uh, not to plumb uh, them. Uh, for example, the contemptuously dismissive attitude of the legal academy a decade ago to constitutional challenges to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Four and a half justices found those constitutional arguments persuasive. There were maybe four and a half law professors in the entire country to go along with them. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was reflecting the academic consensus when she said in 2009, when a reporter asked her about the constitutionality of Obamacare, are you serious? Are you serious? Uh, then there are uh, third issues about how Congress is supposed to fulfill its role, whatever that role may be. And here things tie in with some of the insightful comments we heard from, from Ira earlier. When Congress exercises its constitutional powers, whatever those turn out to be, how, how should it go about doing so? And I wanna focus my comments here on that last set of questions, though I'm happy to talk about any of the others as well, if, if people want to. Uh, and there are some issues regarding those forms of congressional action that are directly addressed by the constitution. Um, Article one, section seven, when Congress is making laws, says a lot about how it's supposed to do that. Uh, when Congress is considering impeaching and removing executive or judicial officials, six provisions in the Constitution say a lot about that. They don't resolve every possible issue that can arise, but they, they at least provide a framework for, for most of the questions that come up. Uh, but there's one very key issue, and this is something that, that Ira highlighted, that is not explicitly addressed in the Constitution. And that's the extent to which Congress is itself supposed to exercise whatever powers it actually possesses, or can instead rely on other people to do its job. Uh, this is conventionally labeled the non-delegation issue. For reasons I'll explain, I prefer to call it the non-subdelegation issue. And it was also doctrinally a non-topic for quite some time. Well, Congresses and presidents uh, basically gave up thinking about it at least a century ago, maybe two centuries ago. And the Supreme Court spent 85 years trying to convince everyone else to do the same, which is how these sweeping delegations that Ira talked about didn't even raise an eyebrow. Uh, doctrinally uh, on the constitutional level. Uh, in 1989, in fact, not that long ago, 1989, the Supreme Court essentially proclaimed uh, the uh, doctrine dead. Uh, and then in 2001, an opinion by my ex-boss, Justice Scalia, uh, said the same thing. Uh, so as, as recently as two decades ago, the Supreme Court was telling people to, to shut up about it. And uh, from roughly 1936 to 2019, the Supreme Court was largely successful. There were a few oddball scholars, you know, and the occasional lower court judge would grumble about it, but uh, it was not a topic of legal conversation in any major way. That actually changed dramatically in 2019 when out of nowhere, nobody saw this coming. It suddenly looked like five justices were willing to rethink in some significant fashion the problem of subdelegation. We don't know what fashion that is, what they're prepared to do. We probably won't know for some years to come, but it's now a little bit harder than it used to be uh, to sweep the issue under the rug. Uh, I don't plan here to resolve the constitutionality of the subdelegation issue for you. I, I think I can, I just don't think I can do it in 10 minutes. Uh, what I want to do instead is suggest some reasons why it's proven so difficult to resolve and then focus on an important aspect of subdelegation that's been largely ignored even by those few of us who were talking about it before 2019. A part of the reason why I think uh, the problem has proved intractable or bedeviled so many people for so long is what I call the Belloc problem from Raiders of the Lost Ark. They're digging in the wrong place. Um, subdelegation was a very well understood phenomenon in the 18th century, not, not so much in the context of government, but in ordinary private arrangements, guardians, 
executors, overseas business agents, lawyers, stewards managing farms, were routinely authorized to manage some portion of the affairs of others in circumstances of trust and confidence. Later, people would look back on those arrangements and call them fiduciary duties. That means duties to act on behalf of someone else for their benefit rather than in your own interests and in accordance with their instructions. And in those private law contexts, the question regularly arose to what extent those fiduciary agents had to exercise personally the functions they were given or could subdelegate their delegated power to someone else. There was founding era common law on this spanning centuries, and it was as clear as any proposition of law can ever be. Fiduciary agents had a prima facie, not an absolute, a prima facie obligation personally to exercise their delegated authorities. Subdelegation was presumptively, not categorically, presumptively forbidden, even when the subagent was likely to do a better job than the original agent. I can give you scads of sources to this effect. There is not a single one I've ever come across to the contrary. Now, this is important. That prohibition was not categorical. There were well-recognized exceptions in the common law to that rule against subdelegation. It could be specifically authorized by the principal. That's what the principal wanted. Uh, there were circumstances where there might be a custom in a particular trade where it was presumed. And there were contexts where it was so obvious from the nature of the task that subdelegation was contemplated that nobody would think that it needed to be explicitly stated. If you charge a non-lawyer with a job that requires a lawyer, the expectation was not that the agent was going to spend years getting a law degree and then do it. They were going to hire a lawyer to deal with that part of the task. All right, so what does all of this private law have to do with Congress? Well, it has everything to do with Congress if one believes that the Constitution is a kind of fiduciary or agency instrument in which we the people, first words of the document, delegated to Congress certain legislative powers, certain things to manage of we the people's affairs. So the background rules regarding subdelegation in fiduciary instruments would presumably apply. Now, I authored a book arguing that that's the right way to think about the Constitution, but I don't think it would have been controversial in the 18th century. A raft of state constitutions at the time openly declared that all of the government actors were fiduciaries, and the ones that didn't say it didn't say it because it was too obvious to say. So I think the result is that if you're trying to think through the problem of delegation or subdelegation, as I would call it, it's you don't look to deep political theory uh, or parsing even of passages from Locke. It's just found in mundane principles of private law. Uh, members of Congress are fiduciary actors. Presumptively, they can't subdelegate their delegated powers. Presumptively, any exceptions? Express authorization? Well, not so much. Custom in the trade? Well, it's hard to find a custom with a odd separation of powers regime like that in the Constitution that didn't have a lot of antecedents. What about circumstances where it's just so obvious that you don't need to say it? Sure. I mean, one of the powers Congress has is the power to coin money. Does that mean members of Congress have to go work in the mint, you know, personally stamping out the coins? Of course not. There are certain functions. They're so obviously subdelegable that you don't need to describe it. Bottom line is that uh, asking can Congress subdelegate it? The law, there's no simple answer. It's, it's, you're going to have to draw on analogies from private law. There may be very different answers across very different powers. There's a wonderful article by an up-and-coming legal scholar named Chad Squidieri that points this out. Uh, not a single subdelegation doctrine. You probably have lots of them uh, for each of the different functions that Congress can perform. But, but even that's not my main point here. Let's assume we can identify a range of topics for which this would seem to uh, uh, prescribe that Congress can subdelegate. To say that someone is authorized to subdelegate their fiduciary powers does, doesn't tell us how they should do it, doesn't tell us when they should do it, whether they should do it. Uh, should the agent exercise that power? Uh, must they do so in the responsible exercise of their duties? To whom? How do you figure out who to subdelegate to? How do you monitor the agents once you subdelegate The things I mentioned about the problems in, 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 in atomic energy, uh, th those, are, those are exactly the questions that come up here. 
And these are especially pertinent questions in the context of what, for lack of a better term, we call the modern administrative state. I'm an administrative law guy, so that's where I tend to go. Uh, one of the chief legitimating tropes for the modern administrative state has long been expertise, right? You don't actually want decisions made by those morons in Congress, do you? They can't even pass a budget. How are they going to figure out particle dispersion patterns and so forth, right? Um, well, are those good grounds for subdelegation under fiduciary principle? Uh, the answer, uh, you may have guessed from my comments, is it depends. Uh, there's a whole lot of questions that one can ask, and I'm, I'm just going to pose the questions. I don't, I don't have the answers. Again, this is why this is such a difficult problem. Uh, is the primary agent, in this case Congress's, own skill and knowledge lacking? Sometimes it might be. Sometimes it might not be. Is the task at hand something for which expertise, even in principle, is likely to help? If we're talking about particle dispersion patterns, probably. If you're talking about whether to sacrifice some people's economic well-being for statistical risks, a reduction of risks and respiratory uh, 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 problems in others, it's not obvious how anyone's expertise, any kind, actually bears on those kinds of trade-offs. If expertise is even potentially relevant, is it actually relevant at the particular margin of decision? Very, very difficult question, not obvious answers. Has the primary agent picked the right subagents? How would you even know what the right subagents are if they're the experts and you aren't? How does a non-expert pick the right expert? And then how do you know whether the subagent is actually exercising their expertise or doing something else, pursuing their own agenda? Again, if you're not the expert, how would you ever know that? These are all extraordinarily difficult questions. They're wildly underanalyzed, at least in the legal literature. Um, leaves more questions than answers. Great news for academics, not necessarily great news for anyone else. But all of this proves nothing more than that hard questions are hard. And these are hard questions. And with that, we should go to colloquy. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, again, a lot to chew on here from a lot of different perspectives. Um, we will be opening the floor to some Q&A uh, shortly, um, but before we get into that, I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to uh, say a few words maybe in response to each other or if they're provoked by something in particular that they want to highlight, um, then we can, uh, we, we can do that. Um, maybe uh, let's just go back in order of everyone. Uh, Ira, let me start with you. Great. Well, uh, thanks, um, uh, Julia and, and, and Gary, for such um, stimulating comments. I see them as fitting together in the following way. We have, we have a question that was just asked about um, how, um, sorry, whether, let me find my uh, scrawl notes. What, the question is, what should Congress be doing? And then, um, and then we have the question is, even if we knew the answer to that question, uh, Julia is asking us, um, under what conditions can Congress do what it's meant to be doing? So we, we both have a kind of um, analytical, theoretical, doctrinal, and persistent set of questions. And then we have um, a, a strategic, um, partisan policy, um, uh, president, Congress, uh, negotiation, um, uh, again, a persisting world, but in both cases, the actual facts on the ground change over time. So it's a mix of the timely and the timeless is um, uh, what, we're, what we're dealing with. So let me make about those just two or three very quick um, uh, sets of thoughts or really questions to my colleagues. Um, one, one set of questions has to do with um, governmental and congressional capacity, broadly speaking, um, and then also with presidential capacity, broadly speaking. I was in the audience in my very, I was very young, but I was in the audience when um, Ted Sorensen delivered a set of lectures, um, a critique of Newstat on the presidency really, saying that out of his experiences of the Kennedy administration, what he learned was how limited presidential power was. Um, we wanted to do A, B, and C and could, could do very little of it. 
Um, now, that wasn't true about if the president decided to send troops uh, or a, a private army to Cuba, or if the president wanted to um, uh, uh, blockade Cuba successfully um, to solve the Cuban Missile Crisis. That wasn't what he was talking about. He was talking about the, the thickness of procedures that um, stand in the way of presidential desire, principally on domestic matters, including matters of delegation and subdelegation, and, and the ability to actually get Congress uh, to do it. Or to put it differently, what I, the punchline I took away years ago and have thought about since from Sorensen was, do we, do we really not have one big jumbo post New Deal administrative state, um, but rather one part which you can read about in the, such great books as David Truman's governmental process of 1951, in which as Truman argued, there is no single sense of public interest in America. Public interest is um, discovered out of the procedural clash of many subjective interests and provisionally some win. We do get Obamacare, but we might've gotten, if not for John McCain's vote, another kind of medical care. Um, these are um, uh, situational matters and the public interest is situational, provisional, uh, temporary. Um, but the procedures are thick if public, even if public interest is, as it were, relatively thin. But then when you move to the, the area in which I was speaking earlier, the national security area, actually procedures are very thin. Um, uh, but the sense of public interest is very strong. Um, the United States fights for and guards liberal democracy, certainly at home, and, um, and if it can, around the globe. Um, and to that set of common purposes, and we saw those common purposes on display this morning um, uh, in the Ukraine, a uh, uh, terrible Ukraine crisis, um, the, um, uh, there are very few um, uh, barriers to action, um, except perhaps geopolitical strategic ones. Um, so we, we have a state that looks just like the pluralist described it from one angle in the 1950s, but also from another angle, the way the critic of the pluralist, like C. Wright Mills, I'm not saying he was right in every detail, was describing the high levels of uh, security power as being different from the pluralist government, which he said was the middle level of power. You don't have to accept the high and the middle, but to think about two separate zones. So one of my questions really is, how do our colleagues think about um, these two zones as throwing up not one set of doctrinal or practical questions, but more than one separate ones? And then a footnote before I stop. Um, uh, which has to do with questions of partisanship and polarization and coalitions that uh, Julia talked about. Um, uh, there is in the literature by historians and, and political scientists, a golden age of um, relatively lower polarization. Um, uh, but what is often forgotten is that the basis of that statistical artifact um, was the existence in effect of a three-party system, uh, Northern Democrats, Southern Democrats, and Republicans. Um, because the Southern Democrats were not elected in the same kind of political system with the same kind of electorate. They had a one-party system, basically, and they had a very constrained electorate. In Mississippi, in 1938, a, a state with 2.3 million people, seven members of Congress were elected in the general election with 43,000 votes. Um, no black people could vote and white people had no reason to turn out to vote because five of the seven were unopposed. Um, uh, and the two who were opposed, the opposition could get 5% of the vote. All the action was in the primaries in the party. Um, in any event, if you look at the substance of representation in the 40s, 50s, um, before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, um, the Southerners 
were on the whole very good liberal De Rooseveltian Truman Democrats on most tax and spend issues uh, and the like, except for labor. Um, and on labor questions, um, they voted with Republicans. You could see this in Taft-Hartley because where the Republicans saw labor versus management, they saw race. Um, and uh, we could, I could go on, I've, I obsess about these questions, but the, the point is that when we talk about coalitions, we should, I, I'd love us to think about today's coalitions as transformed from coalitions in my lifetime that looked very different, both inside the Republican Party and inside the Democratic Party, and ask ourselves, what are the um, situational arrangements that make it possible for parties to reorganize the people they choose to vote for them? Think of a white working class and who, who votes for whom now, as opposed to 30 years ago in Michigan or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. Uh, or think about who votes for whom in Alabama or Mississippi as compared to either not being able to vote or voting for the different, very different party. Um, and how much, what drives those changes? And when we get those changes, what are their implications for the issues um, that uh, Gary raised about um, uh, how we appropriately or inappropriately, depending on our preference, um, structure the role of the federal government. So thank you both for these great comments. Thank you. That's that's very helpful and, and very provocative. Um, let me uh, let me turn the floor to Julia Azari for a few minutes and let her uh, give some responses as well. Okay, great. Uh, I have so much written down. I don't know how I'm going to pull out um, key things here. Um, and briefly, I was uh, joined by my very loud cat, but she seems to have left the room. So, uh, <laughs> so you're all safe. So there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. Since I brought up coalitions and race, I, I want to briefly respond to Ira. And this is really, this is really deeply self-serving of me because I'm working on a project where one of my arguments is that the, the coalitions in the kind of post-civil rights parties are different, but not, but, and they're sorted, but not that sorted and different, but not that different. Um, and so this is really self-serving for me to get feedback about this. But essentially, I mean, essentially what I see is, is sort of what I said um, in terms of the Democratic Party, which is that you have a party that is, I think, pretty shallowly racially liberal, but actually where a lot of the different elements of the coalition have different relationships to some of the more pressing questions of, of race, whether that's economic distribution, whether that's policing, whether that's, that's education. Um, and I think to to a more complex degree, I think that's also true in the Republican Party, and I think that the, the presidencies of, of Obama and Trump really, really pushed at those compromises. This is what my, my book's about. Um, and that you had a sort of Republican trajectory between, say, be between sort of the early 70s going up through the Obama presidency, in which you had a coalition that was dependent on some of the votes of the kind of successors to those Southern elements that Ira was talking about um, and to some, some real racists and also people who truly kind of believed in Reagan's colorblind vision. Uh, and those two groups could kind of comfortably coexist until Obama. I think the same is sort of broadly true about, um, about the Democrats, even though the, the differences are, the differences are different. Um, so that's, you know, that's a coalitional thing I'm thinking about. And I think that you know, I'm very far to one end of the spectrum in terms of people who think that all of American politics is about race and obviously been very, very shaped and influenced by Ira's work and by other work in that, in that vein, especially about kind of the, the role of race in the New Deal. Um, so that's something I'm really thinking about with regard to coalitions. And I think once again, to kind of bring this back to the, the separation of powers, I think this has some real implications for what presidents can do because presidents ultimately are sort of given this, this dual role of being the party spokesperson and the national spokesperson. And then adding to that, I think being the kind of party factional spokesperson in a situation in which party factions are increasingly the divisions that kind of meaningful divisions in people's lives because the two parties now operate in such different spheres. Like I basically think you have a microcosm of political competition happening in the Democratic Party 
um, that's very all encompassing without without even thinking about people outside that coalition. So that's a little a field of our of our topic today. But I think, like I said, it does shape the dilemma that presidents find themselves in. The second thing I'm I'm sort of thinking about has to do with the kind of comments that that Gary made about the administrative state and with this sort of you know how these things evolve and it occurred to me that one of the ways in which presidents have power is really in path dependence where you know you have a moment in which the president is able to shape the political situation and make it tenable to expand the administrative state as in the new deal or to exp or to set the direction of foreign policy as in the Iraq war or to do both as in the creation of Homeland Security. Um, and the, the, those moments are short, like the political capital that leads to those moments is very short lived. But once you set the country on, on that path, it's very different, it's very difficult to get off of that path. And so I think that that's, you know, one of the ways we might think about presidential powers is, is in, this, in this temporal way. Very rarely are presidents able to, to really shape the direction of political conversation um, to kind of borrow the phrase from, from Northwestern Davis Rescue to shape political reality, but the, the impact of those moments, those short-lived moments is very profound. Um, and then I guess the last question, and I'm sort of riffing off of, I was thinking a lot about this as Gary was kind of talking about the constitutional theory um, and non-delegation doctrine is really interesting, but I, I'm sort of thinking about this from the perspective of how can we kind of honor the the limited government tradition of the constitution and simultaneously make the country governable. This is really the question, all this other stuff I've mentioned for me is mostly an intellectual interest, but making the country governable is what keeps me up at night. And, and I live in Wisconsin, which is, you know, well, microcosm of a lot of these dimensions that we're, we're talking about. Um, it's not even clear to me that my own state is governable. So that's really the the question that I'm thinking about as we think about these um, constitutional traditions, political traditions, coalitions, and other things like that. Thank you. Um, again, a lot to chew on here. Um, let me turn it to uh, Gary Lawson uh, for some responses, and then afterwards we will uh, um, open it up a little more. Go ahead. Yeah, just two quick thoughts on, on, on some things that Julia said. Uh, at the very end of her talk, I started drawing circles and stars all over my notepad when she talked about the relationship between President Trump and, and Congress. And I think that was, that was, that was dead on. Um, he couldn't get funding for the wall. He couldn't get immigration reform. He couldn't get Obamacare repealed. Almost anything that a Trump supporter would consider an accomplishment of the Trump administration did not come from legislation, it came from regulatory policy. Uh, again, I'm an administrative law guy, so I may be biased in that regard about the importance of administrative law, but that's, that's where I'm, the, the Trump ran against, 19, in 2016, he ran against the Republican establishment as hard or harder. Uh, as he ran uh, against the Democrats. The, the anointed of the Republican establishment was Jeb Bush. Uh, just like in 2000, the anointed was George Bush. It's just that in 2000, I won't call them the conservatives because I think that's inaccurate. The anti-establishment Republicans couldn't coalesce around an alternative. Uh, in 2016, they could coalesce around uh, an alternative and <laughs> he squashed Jeb Bush like a bug. But None of that had to do with Congress. None of that translated into anything in, 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 in Congress. Uh, the other thing uh, I, would, I would throw out is, it, 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 Julia is absolutely right that there is a very serious question about the relationship between classical or civics book conceptions of governance and what it is that you want the government to do. Um, in 1989, when the Supreme Court was trying to get rid of talk about the subdelegation problem, there was a famous line, I'm doing it from memory, Congress simply can't do its job absent a broad authority to delegate or authority to delegate under broad standards. Well, what, what exactly is Congress's job? If Congress's job is to do what people in the 18th century thought Congress's job was, no, it probably doesn't need to do any of that. Congress's job is to micromanage pretty much everything. If what it means for the country to be governable is uh, 
you actually have to have a Leviathan state. Well, if, yeah, of course, Congress, 535 people can't handle that. It's going to happen. So yeah, absolutely, there is a there is a close connection between, as a practical matter, uh, the extent of subdelegation and, and what it is that one wants government to do. That's doctrinally very important. Uh, here, I'm going to wax as a law professor. Uh, when uh, he raised this issue in a dissenting opinion in 2019, uh, Justice Gorsuch was at great pains to say that his concerns about reviving the, 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 the subdelegation doctrine did not have to do with the scope of government power. It had to do with how government power was exercised. Uh, with respect, I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that you can keep those issues uh, distinct. Uh, but with that, let me shut up and uh, thank you all for, for really, really thoughtful uh, remarks. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I'm gonna just kind of open it up at this point. Um, if folks in the audience wanna put uh, questions in the chat um, and I can uh, pose them to our panelists or if the panelists just wanna uh, go at it a little bit, uh, feel free. Um, we're kind of in our own time here and we can we can do as we wish. If nobody else jumps in, I'll start uh, I'll start with something um, that occurred to me as we were uh, um, having these conversations and I was taking um, a, a lot of notes on a variety of these issues, thinking about Ira's remarks in particular about um, national security. Um, and one thing that occurs to me as somebody who's done some work on, um, on national security, they didn't call it then, but the, the army and, and issues of security in early America is, you know, how much has changed? Obviously, we have a large administrative state. We have all kinds of powers and, and things that couldn't have existed in, in the beginnings of American history, things no one could have possibly foreseen on a geopolitical stage, the might of American military power, world wars, um, obviously, that has changed the scope of this, but I wonder at the granular level how much has changed, um, just in terms of sort of these questions about uh, um, delegation from Congress to the president in foreign policy or in national security policy, um, and then what that tells us about uh, uh, Congress's changing role in some of these questions. If I could jump in on that one. Um, I think you're right that there are a good many persisting um, questions, and I, I refer to them perhaps um, not too quickly as Article I versus Article II uh, tensions. Um, you have a commander in chief, but you also have the power to make war or declare war in the Congress. Uh, it, 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 but I think the point that actually um, was underscored in, uh, by Hamilton in the Federalist Papers, the importance of a provision in the Constitution that uh, required uh, that any spending on military matters, any bill that passes to authorize and appropriate funds for the military, not have a lifespan of more than two years. Um, and um, uh, this Hamilton and others uh, uh, underscored. And of course, Hamilton was on the strong government side of various debates of the period, but he liked that constraint because it was uh, one means centered in Congress mm -hmm. and with the need to be responsive to the public, the electorate, um, a way of controlling um, uh, the degree of discretion that would sit in the executive branch about military uh, matters. First, second thing that might be noted um, uh, concerns a term I believe was first used by Calhoun when he was Secretary of War, namely the concept of an expansible, his word, an expansible military. Mm -hmm. um, that is, there was and always has been, certainly both in Britain and, and the United States, um, concern about uh, large standing armies, especially large standing armies at home, um, who might be tempted to um, move beyond the limits of constitutional uh, power. Now, 
we've not had coups in, in America, but one doesn't have to look very far um, uh, uh, to look at, at republics with constitutions not very different than ours, where the military has not been so um, self under self control, as it were. And the um, uh, the idea of an expansible military was you train a professional elite. Uh, West Point's created, um, and later um, Annapolis. Um, but you largely depend ordinarily on a very small military position structurally in harbors or along rivers or along roads to secure the country, um, but only in wartime to mobilize uh, large armies and then demobilize. And that goes hand in hand with a final point is a larger sense that has governed control over national security and military issues for more than a you know, number, number of centuries in the American experience now. Namely, that when there's an emergency, there's a mobilization, but then what should follow is a demobilization. Uh, even immediately after the Second World War, we demobilized very quickly from 16 million under arms to a million and a half. However, two big changes happen. And I think this is a permanent change in our condition. There's nothing any president can do about it. Um, uh, uh, a, there's the world of atomic power. Uh, B, there's um, uh, a sense of a, a global role for the United States that um, requires vastly larger permanent military expenditures and presence. I'm not arguing right or wrong, just a fact um, that even when you talk about budget cuts or increases in the military budget, this is a relatively trivial as compared to the sheer scale of the thing um, uh, 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 globally. Um, and uh, so I think we're, we no longer have this kind of expansible um, up and down, only mobilize an emergency world of national security. It's a permanent world. And I think it's a very hard set of uh, normative and practical and policy questions about how to deal with that world in a way that's consistent with the highest values of a liberal democracy. Thank you. And of course, if you don't deal with that world, um, liberal democracy is vulnerable. Um, and if you over deal with that world, you can hollow out liberal democracy from within. Yeah, I was thinking about that in terms of some of the tensions over um, questions of national security and also sort of thinking about it in terms of, because um, I knew your remarks would talk about the, the modern day national security state and thinking about previous crises involving questions of national security and how those polarized our politics say in the, the late 18th century over the quasi war with France and tensions between the Jeffersonians and the Federalists as well. Just one thought that plays beautifully into Julia's comment about the stickiness of changes. Never let a crisis go to waste. Changes are very hard to do, but they're often even harder to undo once they're in place. Since we're coming up on April, I keep thinking of withholding tax, that World War II emergency measure which somehow still seems to be around 80 years later. Who, 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 who knew? Who would have guessed? William, we've got some great questions in the chat. Yeah. If you don't mind, I want to grab sure. one of them if that's okay. Yeah, um, do you want to read it or, or uh, just sort yes. of? Yes, let me, let me um, sort of par paraphrase this. I think that, um, this person has a really great, uh, great set of comments here. And she asks, could the panel please speak to the remedies, if any, to America's impoverished civic understanding of constitutional separation of powers? What are the stakes when we leave these concerns to lawyers and law scholars, as Dr. Lawson has noticed? So I, I wanted to take this question in a slightly different direction. Um, the, the rest of the question kind of speaks to broadly to kind of civic challenges in the United States. And I think that one of the, the major challenges to kind of civic knowledge and participation in the United States is actually the nationalization of, of Congress. Um, and that's, I think, kind of one of the ways in which 
the roles of president and Congress are more clearly delineated at other points in history was the president was poised to deal with national issues, the Congress more localized. Um, and what that means is obviously contextual too. But right now, the media environment that we have and the sort of party politics expectations are that members of Congress are speaking to a national audience all the time. And they're often speaking to that audience in, in a mediated way on social media, um, through cable news. And those don't have, are not without their advantages, but I think that ultimately kind of what gets people involved in a, in a civic way and in a kind of more robust way and not just scrolling through social media, which I'm totally guilty of, um, is the, kind of more localized and, and involved in these sort of more local linkages. And so it, it seems in a way sort of weird to, to suggest that um, one way to improve a kind of national civic investment is actually for people to become more parochial and localized. But I think that in this case, if members of Congress were maybe more focused on their districts, less focused on national audiences, that that would be a start. And my cat's now losing her mind. Can I just jump in on, on that one? There, there was a, a draft of the original constitution that would have placed a very strict limit on the number of people that any member of Congress could represent. Uh, if that had become part of the constitution, we would now have about 7,000 members of Congress. So there are very, very interesting questions about to what extent it is possible for a Congress to be local rather than national, given that the number of members of Congress has not increased in proportion to the population, so that you have people representing many, many more times as a uh, constituent would have been shocking uh, to, to the founding generation. On the question that's in the chat, I, I latched onto that one as well. Uh, understanding of separation of powers, well, I mean, the simple fact is that there are not that many people who actually have an interest in promoting civic understanding of separation of powers and a lot of people who don't. Uh, the, the original idea of separation of powers is essentially to make it really hard for people who you think are bad to do bad things. At the same time, it's going to make it really hard for people that you think are good to do good things. The founding generation worried a whole lot more about the bad people doing bad things. By the time you get to the late 19th century and you get the rise of the progressive movement, they're more worried about not being able to do what they think are good things. And as all of them understood uh, from Wilson onward, separation of powers is a real you know, party pooper. Uh, it makes it really, really hard. Uh, to, to ram through the kind of parliamentary program that you can see uh, in, in, in other countries. So it, it's not just a question of educating people. It's a, you have to convince a whole lot of people that it's a good idea. Uh, and there's a whole lot of people that are going to tell you, and they've been telling you for 150 years, that it's really not a good idea. Uh, so it's a much, much deeper and, and harder task uh, than the than the comment suggests. I'm entirely sympathetic with it because I'm more worried about bad people doing bad things. I'm a tiny minority uh, in the academic community on that on that front. Um, so I don't have an answer, but it's yeah. This is this is the things that keep Julie up at night. This is the sort of thing that keeps me up at night, wondering how how to deal with that. Of, of yeah, course. and I think go ahead, Arira. Go ahead. Uh, the, the phrase bad people doing bad things, which I, I too stay up at night worrying about, depends how we define the content of bad. But that's, uh, um, I, I just want to make, come in on the point of um, Julia raised and now has been commented on on the local and the national, uh, the, the character of representation, um, you know, who's being represented and so on. From a national point of view, I think, again, since the 1950s, there have been maybe more than these, but three astonishingly large transformations to the character of the social base of politics, um, and not in any particular order. Um, uh, first, let's just say the death, and I use the word, um, of, uh, of private sector trade unions as a national political force. In, in the middle of the Eisenhower administration, more than one in three Americans uh, who worked in the private sector, 
belonged to uh, AFL CIO unions. Uh, today, 6%, uh, roughly, five and a half, six, um, trivial by uh, comparison. Um, like either you can think of that as a good thing or a bad thing. I, 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 there's a debate about that. I understand that. Um, but it, it, it's transformed the nature of coalitions within certainly one of the two major parties. Um, it also changed um, the, um, the way in which issues got filtered to millions of Americans through uh, pr private sector leadership groups, in this case, union locals. That's one big change. Second huge change has been the relative decline of mainstream Protestantism and the concomitant rise of uh, evangelical uh, Protestantism within, not just within the churches, but within political life. Um, after the Scopes trial um, in the 20s, there was a withdrawal from politics by many evangelicals. Um, and it took decades for there to be a return. And it was an act of genius on the part of the Republican Party to find issues that could remobilize um, uh, dormant evangelical communities at just the moment when um, the mainstream, whether they be uh, Methodists or Presbyterians and others, um, were facing um, uh, a kind of hollowing out, not, not as dramatic as um, the unions, but a, a relative change. And finally, there's the Southern realignment. Um, and th both the entry of African-Americans uh, into political life um, and the, the reorganization of partisanship, largely, not entirely, um, along racial lines in the two-party system south of the Mason-Dixon line. So what it means to have national coalitions and national representation is profoundly affected by social base transformations, which are not just local, that you can talk about the South as local, but that Southern transformation had deep national implications for the role of race in national politics. Um, and, I, you know, just struck by that. And um, we have different kinds of expertise, but we don't have sociologists on this, uh, on this panel and thinking about the social base of politics. Um, and one could talk about uh, mobility and class and uh, opportunity inequality. You could, there are a lot of issues that could be uh, added which affect profoundly the character of um, political representation and with it, the scope of opportunity for members of Congress um, uh, to behave and make law. Yeah, thank you. And I think that also gets to some of the points Julia was making earlier about work by Liliana Mason and others that have dealt with some of these questions in the contemporary context anyway about identity politics and, and the social basis of partisan polarization today and ties into these questions of the, the shifting coalitions as well. Um, another question in the Q&A that came through uh, to everyone, how do you think that the extreme focus on the psychology or personality of the executive e.g. is it someone you'd like to have a beer with, how has that affected the popular understanding of the role of the executive? I'll open that up to anyone who wants to take a stab at it. I mean, this is so far outside anything I can plausibly claim to talk about. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is, is refer to another law professor uh, by the name of Ilya Soman, who has written extensively on sort of the, the, the information that voters have, what, what rational basis voters have. And again, this is a function of, in, in, in the 18th oh. century, when it was probably more important who was mayor of your town than who was president, there just wasn't a whole lot you needed to know about somebody in order to decide who you wanted to vote for president. It wasn't gonna matter that much. The sheer amount, uh, the scope of, of national activity, the scope of, of what a president can do these days is just so spectacularly enormous that nobody, nobody on this chat, none of us, none of our colleagues, nobody can actually process more than a tiny fraction of the information 
that would be necessary to make a an informed rational choice uh, in these oh. things. You're getting you're getting packages, part of which you're going to like, part of which you're not going to like, and are the parts that you like actually better than the parts that you don't like? Well, you actually don't know that because you have no idea how these things are going to play out. So is it unreasonable or irrational for somebody to choose who they like? It's not obvious to me that that's an irrational choice. Not obvious at all to me that that's, that's an unreasonable thing for someone to do under the current circumstances. Or whatever that's worth. So I actually think it's sort of the the direction is maybe the opposite of what most people would think. Um, and that some of this some of this stuff has emerged. The idea of the president is someone you want to have a beer with are these kind of like portraits of, of ordinariness and glances of intimacy is kind of deliberate rhetorical efforts to soften and democratize. In, in a situation in which we have an incredibly strong executive. And I actually deal with this a little bit in my first book when I talk about the development of the kind of post Watergate mandate rhetoric and the way that, that Carter tried to democratize and soften the image of the office in ways that were often not that successful. Um, you know, more successful at this were, was George W. Bush. I think this was once again, sort of integrated with the partisanship and cultural visions, but I also think that there can be this kind of reinforcing effect um, where people see the president as kind of the central figure, they identify with the president, and then they expect the president to do something about, again, to sort of paraphrase, paraphrase Newstat, to do something about everything. Um, I think there can be this sort of cyclical effect, but I think that's the, I think this sort of imagery is very deliberately crafted um, as a response to the expansion of presidential power. An interesting and provocative point also, although I think about it, you know, slightly in, in comparative terms to somebody like Andrew Jackson, who popularized the presidency um, on purpose um, while claiming to weaken national governance. Um, whether he actually did that is a, a different question, maybe, um, but we've kind of got this long tradition of certain people having to try to do that. Obviously, the character and form of that has shifted uh, uh, somewhat in the years since, um, but certainly not not the first time you know a politician has handed out whiskey or or whatnot to uh, to their supporters in exchange uh, for their votes. Uh, usually, bribery is illegal nowadays, but uh, it doesn't have to be quite so explicit, I suppose. Um, another question that came through on the uh, on the Q and A chat. Um, if partisan polarization is inevitable and is stifling progress, what's the solution to actually advancing policy? Um, at best, when we get uh, unanimous or near unanimous decision making, it's around issues like infrastructure or now perhaps daylight savings time. Um, perhaps we'd be better off with an element of direct democracy instead. Uh, any thoughts uh, on, on those questions? Polarization is a, a really tricky business. Um, some of you will know that in 1950, a very famous report published by the American Political Science Association um, that in part was initiated at the request of President Truman that lamented the fact that we didn't have what they called a sufficiently responsible party system. We weren't, we were too much muddled in the middle and too much overlap and the voters didn't know exactly what they were choosing, which package they were um, uh, choosing. And uh, you can make an argument for more or less party division um, dependent. I, I think what varies is less polarization than it's maybe something Julia was alluding to earlier than rare sets of circumstances that allow um, the governing party um, to actually create a new reality that lasts, the path dependent question that Gary also uh, uh, underscored and that Julia raised. Um, if you think about on the side of the Democratic Party where there have been policy changes that have capital E endured over decades, you know, Social Security Act, um, uh, minimum wage, maximum hours, or the, the New Deal package, or Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, Johnson, um, there were huge 
um, Democratic majorities in the House and Senate at the time. Um, there was a lot of polarization, but the opposition had, you know, if you read Herbert Hoover on what Roosevelt was doing, you would think he was worse than Mussolini and Hitler. Um, but somehow he mobilized huge recurring majorities, not just in one election, but in a number of elections that um, transformed America and may well have scared the Supreme Court. Um, the, uh, and um, you see this in, 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 sometimes it's not the electoral majority, it's the situation uh, itself that, uh, you know, the post uh, Iran hostage world into which Ronald Reagan came uh, made his life that combination of raising defense spending, lowering taxes, cutting regulation, following Carter on this, um, easier to put together. There was a yearning for an active president. Um, it almost mattered less for many Americans that it was a conservative president. Um, it mattered for a lot that it was, but an effective president at a moment when the United States seemed so ineffectual um, on, a, on a wider um, stage. So situation, both electoral and contextual, um, alter. And in those circumstances, it may matter less whether the parties are more or less dramatically divided um, than it does about the opportunity offered leadership and in which Congress and members of Congress feel they really can't block what the leader um, wants to do. Uh, think of how many Democrats actually voted for um, Reagan tax cuts or, um, or how many um, uh, Republicans actually um, voted for aspects of the Johnson program in the end. Um, so those are just some thoughts uh, um, about polarization. I mean, because I'm not a political scientist, I'm going to come at this one sideways. Uh, even if you take polarization as a given, that doesn't mean nothing happens. It just means that things happen within the administrative state rather than through Congress. In the last decade or two, there have been avulsive changes in, for example, energy policy, not because of any legislation that Congress enacted. Congress wasn't doing anything at all, but because you had changes in regulatory policy. And those, those changes are as profound or more profound than anything you're ever going to see from any legislation that even comes out of a unified Congress. Uh, so again, I, you know, I have the bias of an administrative law guy, but it, it's, it's very easy to say polarized Congress, Congress does nothing, nothing happens. Uh, the last part of that is, is manifestly not so. Julia, any thoughts you want to uh, jump in there with on uh, some of these questions about polarization and bipartisan policymaking or whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I think this the the question that's being posed really gets to what I was saying before about whether the country is governable, um, and I think that that essentially speaks to you know whose job is it to convey a sense and instill a sense in various constituencies that we have, there are some common problems that a large enough coalition of Americans sort of share a perspective on that we can actually pass policy. It doesn't have to be unanimous, right? It, um, right now, the Senate is a sort of super major, majoritarian body, and there's debates about whether that will change, and maybe it will change. Um, but even so, you know, our, like, I, I've, I've written about this most recently after the Virginia gubernatorial election, where we sort of are stuck in this dynamic in American politics. We expect the president's party to lose in that, you know, the weird off year elections in, in Virginia and New Jersey. We expect that to go badly for the president's party. We expect the midterms to go badly for the president's party. And we kind of don't ask why, you know, why we vacillate wildly. Um, from these sorts of change perspectives and then not a lot actually changes. I think that's a really dangerous, that's a really dangerous dynamic. And I think that stagnation is, is really um, a problem. And I, I don't have the answer, honestly, to that. that. That was, I think the presidency was sort of a makeshift answer to that around a century ago. And that's sort of like a Wilsonian vision of the presidency, which I'm, is not without its problems. Um, 
but that was, I think, like a, a stopgap measure. And now the presidency has been so polarized as well. We don't have any, we don't have any stopgap measures. Everything is divisive and everything is sort of caught up in, in really an endless cycle of anger and resentment and media frenzy. And I think that's really a serious, serious problem. Because we've had too much agreement on this panel, I have to interject a bit of disagreement just to throw things off. Um, as, a, as an ardent libertarian, I would view ungovernability as a feature, not a bug. <laughs> I don't want to be governed. I want to be left the freak alone. And if there are a lot of people who have the same attitude, then yeah, it would not be surprising if it was difficult to govern a country of 330 million folk. And again, I'm just going to go back to the 18th century. It's a wonderful colloquy at the, at the Constitutional Convention uh, when uh, people were talking about this limitation on how many people could be represented. And James Madison said, you're going to end up with thousands of members of Congress. And the person who was proposing this, Nathaniel Gorham from Massachusetts, said, eh, country isn't going to last that long. What are you talking about? <laughs> We're already so big. It's gonna, we won't have a single country by then. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, 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 is a, there is an economic and uh, uh, other literature on the optimal size of countries. A very good argument that whatever the optimal size of a country is, the United States has long since passed it. Uh, and certainly if you look at what's happened around the world in the last you know, since post World War II, it's not more countries consolidate. It's fewer consolidating to fewer countries. It's 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 breaking up into a whole lot of smaller ones. Uh, so un ungovernability may just be the way of the world. Uh, and uh, maybe the next topic for this kind of panel is secession. I, I, that came up before we started this. Uh, that's a fascinating question uh, about about the optimal size the optimal size of a country. Though the word China, um, uh, simply, um, at least on the face of it, contradicts the idea that the world is simply shattering into lots of smaller units of governance. Um, and uh, in ways m many of us find uh, deeply problematical, um, the Chinese have managed government, central single party government, has managed to impose itself on well over a billion people um, who themselves have many dimensions of heterogeneity um, in, a, in a profoundly unified, um, almost straitjacket way. So the, um, I'm, that's not an endorsement, um, uh, but, the, um, uh, but nor do I think, um, uh, and here if we want to disagree, I think uh, it's very hard to have liberty in a purely libertarian basis. Um, uh, and that's a, that's a matter of, um, you know, longer. Um, <laughs> more relaxed uh, uh, conversation. Um, they sound the same, but it's not identical, um, uh, although the claim is made. The, um, uh, so the, but the question is, I think, the one I ended my brief opening talk with, which was Hamilton's, is how do you find a sweet spot that combines uh, private rights, as it were, or collective and individual rights, um, the rights of the Bill of Rights, uh, um, including the enumerated powers questions and so on. Um, how do you manage that in tandem with uh, questions of great common um, shared capacity and the need for collective judgment, regulation, mm -hmm. decision, not least matters of physical security, but not only matters of physical security. There can be no national marketplace um, without rules. Um, uh, there, you know, there can be no highway system without um, a, a structure of governance um, uh, uh, and, and decisions. So how, that's a permanent dilemma, um, which I think um, cannot be resolved by um, either big words like um, uh, planning or um, capital M or markets, capital uh, M, capital M markets, P, capital planning, we're always going to have some mix of um, uh, decision making and collective um, judgment, expertise, and bottom up participation and resistance. Um, 
And that's the stuff of politics, um, which uh, will not be resolved simply at, it should be debated at a philosophical level, but is never fully resolved at a philosophical um, level. If I could jump back in on that point, and, and I think something else we talked about um, in terms of national security politics here that occurs to me is that thinking about this in terms of um, you know, bipartisan policymaking, well, one of the areas we've had quite a lot of bipartisan policymaking sometimes is on questions of national security. Um, uh, deciding to go to war in Afghanistan or deciding to go to war in Iraq in 2003 by overwhelming majorities, even the war in Iraq, which was relatively controversial, in Congress, the vote was not particularly close um, on the passage of laws like the Patriot Act or other things, or previous to that, as Ira was talking about, with the atomic uh, energy laws or the National Security Acts of 1947 and 1949. This seems to be an area, or today, where we're passing aid to Ukraine in large amounts, but unable to agree on amounts for COVID relief that's still caught up in Congress. National security seems to be one area where, despite the polarization at times, often that's when Congress can act rapidly. But it's not always been so. Um, that, be clear, I mean, certainly if you go back to the 1790s um, and even think of the period of the Alien and Sedition Acts mm -hmm. um, in the quasi-war against the French, um, but to me, <laughs> The single most important national security vote in the 20th century, that's a pretty big statement, uh, came in 1941. Um, and it went 203 to 202 in the House. Um, the, uh, in 1940, the Congress had passed the first peacetime conscription, but it was hedged by all kinds of limits. Um, you could only uh, draft people to serve in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so isolationists in the language of the time could vote for that. Um, and the conscription would only last one year in the emergency that was under, under uh, was happening. But in 41, Roosevelt goes back and said, not good enough anymore. Um, we're in real peril in the summer. This is six months before Pearl Harbor. Um, we were not at war. He said, we have to remove the one year limit and remove the prohibition on serving outside the Western Hemisphere. Please vote on this, Congress. And they did, 203 to 202 in the House. Um, it's not a big counterfactual that had one vote shifted, uh, you know, whoever the mansion was at the time, um, that um, uh, at Pearl Harbor, we would have had an army smaller than Belgium's um, and no real Navy to speak of. Um, uh, so the, um, uh, and why am I going on about that, except that I was fascinated by that vote, is we have to ask ourselves, under what conditions do you get this kind of um, national security unanimity, and when do you get real division? Um, Vietnam War produced division, mm -hmm. um, and then the, in the mid-70s, uh, Senator Church led a quite successful effort to get Congress to pass legislation presidents hated, um, uh, restricting the role of presidents and enlarging the role of Congress in foreign affairs and in security affairs. That in fact, didn't prove to be the dominant outcome in the longer run, but there are moments where the security question does come to be um, politicized and polarized. Um, and other moments uh, when when it um, when it doesn't. Yeah, and and on that, um, let me. We had one more come up in the Q and A about um, the international sanctions that the world has put on Russia and the situation with Ukraine, um, and whether that will be enough to help alleviate the situation. None of us here are experts on international relations or security issues, um, but thinking about it again from this domestic politics perspective. Um, uh, right now, obviously, uh, uh, aid to Ukraine is extremely popular and bipartisan. Um, but nevertheless, we are also simultaneously having this conversation or debate over, uh, uh, it's kind of comparable to the who lost China debates, maybe, of the, the 40s and 50s of, uh, uh, you know, why did this happen? Who, who is responsible? Um, 
is Biden weak? Is Biden responding too late? Is Was Trump better at this? Was Trump worse at this? Thinking about it in the context of his first impeachment trial and things of that nature. Um, I wonder uh, how long it will be before these issues become polarized again. Julia, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I do. And I'm at this point, we've had several questions. So I'm going to answer something that is probably some unholy mush of all the questions. But, you know, one thing that really struck me um, I've been treating my students at Marquette to a lengthy unit on the George W. Bush presidency, which I don't think they were expecting, um, is that the, the, the dynamics of the involvement in the war in Iraq and the dynamics of the politics of the Ukraine situation have one kind of important parallel, um, which is that they seem to unify the president's party for the most part um, and divide the, the opposition party. And, you know, that's really pronounced in Iraq. And I think it's, I think Republicans are kind of still figuring out where they're at on this one. Um, but I think that's important. Um, and I think that it's important because it represents like a very, again, thinking about the kind of path dependency of these things, a very specific moment in time um, in which it seems important to do something. And that those moments fade very quickly. Um, and so that, I think the Ukraine situation is, is distinct because there's so many ge geopolitical implications of what the U.S. might do um, that it's, it's sort of a different conversation that's happening mostly outside of the kind of domestic partisan politics. But it does seem to me that there's this persistent dynamic of getting involved is popular at first. And if you don't do it, there's questions about why didn't you do more? This is the story of Clinton in Rwanda. This is the story of Obama and Syria. And if you do get involved, that inevitably doesn't go that well, because if the situation were going well, we wouldn't be as asking these questions, right? The U.S. does not get involved in these sorts of conflicts if there's an easy, obvious solution. Um, and, you know, that's the story of Libya, that's the story of Iraq, that's the story of Vietnam. Um, and they become unpopular over time. Um, and mm -hmm. then the question is, like, what, how do we get out and what do we do? Um, so I think it's really, I mean, the ultimate thing here is I think it's kind of a lose-lose situation, but you do have this brief political moment where it, it unifies the president's party and divides the opposition. That's very interesting. And there's definitely been work done also on, uh, on some of these issues by uh, Will Howell, John Peavhaus, Doug Kreiner, and others on uh, how, how these dynamics play out in Congress after a while. Um, Congress sometimes will come later and restrict what presidents can do, thinking of Vietnam and, and what Ira was talking about, the, the reaction to it in the 70s. But initially, when Johnson goes to the Congress and says, they've attacked us and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution is passed, it's not really seen as particularly controversial, nor was entering Afghanistan seen as in 2001, seen as particularly controversial with oh, one or two minor exceptions in Congress who voted against it, uh, Barbara Lee and a few others. Um, and, and the dynamics of this seem to constantly reproduce. Um, but in Congress, nevertheless, they figure out ways to shape what that looks like through the, the messaging and the partisan opposition, um, which does play into what presidents can do. It's not a great check on presidential power, perhaps, perhaps not the one the, the, the writers of the Constitution might have intended um, from their perspective, from a legal perspective, certainly, but from a political perspective, it, it does create some dynamics that work against pure unilateral presidential control. I mean, can I ask a question? Well, William, do you think that that, yeah. that dynamic is also sort of what explains Iraq and then Libya? where you sort of get, pre like, is, is that, is Congress trying to kind of restrict Obama and the Libya Arab Spring situation kind of analogous to the war powers resolution? I mean, it's a sort of similar situation to where you have a more hostile Congress in the next administration. Possibly. Um, certainly presidents have to act differently according to those scholarly findings about, uh, 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 you know, when Congress is, is controlled by the opposition party, it definitely restricts the range of presidential action to some extent. Um, and obviously with what happened afterwards in Benghazi and the investigations that followed from that, um, 
clearly the dynamics uh, are, are changed. And, and for Biden today, of course, as well, because he was in those conversations during the Obama presidency, I think speaks a lot to the, the, the ways that he is dealing with this current situation and why the accusations of leading from behind are coming because he is reluctant to push too hard knowing that down the line our involvement might backfire. Right. Well, it will almost certainly backfire. Right. If, um, if the president's goal were exclusively to inflict maximum harm on Putin right now, um, he would lift all restrictions immediately on um, oil from two really pretty bad regimes, uh, in Iran and Venezuela. Um, uh, but uh, that's another set of considerations. Um, so the point is even where there's presidential discretion, uh, it never comes clean. Um, uh, if he were to say, let Venezuelan oil, you know, flow much more freely than we've tried to make it not flow, or certainly Iranian oil, um, then um, he's opening up another can of worms. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 these are not easy uh, judgments. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, or no fly zone and questions of risking direct confrontation with an atomic power. None of us would want to be sitting in the, you know, in the office or in the situation room and saying, we know for sure that A and B is the right answer. Um, and surrounding that is the, the normal rhythm of electoral politics, um, which is, um, uh, and on, on balance, a good thing that, um, we have authorities who know that ultimately they have to make their case to the people. But the, um, uh, even if they have few constraints over what they can do in the short run. Um, so it's, you know, long winded way to say, um, A, I don't know the answer to the question as put, um, and a, a B, um, uh, although some of the time, some of us may wish we had authority to make policy judgments about things we deeply care about, whether to do with regulation or to do with uh, policy initiatives. In this zone, I don't envy um, uh, the leaders who have to make these, um, these very pressing judgments uh, about how broadly to protect a decent global order. Um, how to, um, how to broadly protect um, constitutional democracies um, and how not to cede a global authority to, uh, to thugs. Um, uh, not an easy set of questions. And another possible follow-up to, to some of this conversation is also about um, the, some of the presidents who have gotten elected recently, both Trump and Obama, came in under conditions where they were speaking in opposition uh, to the foreign policy establishment in some meaningful way. Uh, Obama coming to fame because of his opposition to the Iraq war, uh, Trump's broader critique of uh, uh, the Western foreign policy establishment, uh, uh, generally speaking. Um, you know, what, what does that mean going forward in terms of uh, uh, those kinds of critiques you know, usually we say voters don't care about foreign policy, they vote on the economy or whatnot. Um, but nevertheless, it does seem like the, there's a, a, a high in, in role for foreign policy questions in our, in our system now. I'll open that up to anyone who wants to take a stab at it in the few minutes we have remaining. I'm not totally sure what the question is. Um, well, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, the degree to which um, those foreign policy questions intrude upon the domestic policy questions in, in elections. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how much it, do you think that matters in terms of the, the shape of, uh, of the elections that we've seen recently? And, you know, Biden isn't primarily elected on those questions, but then again, there is an intersection with 
his foreign policy experience and some of that, that question coming to bear on his ability to win a primary because he's seen as somebody experienced enough to be president who's going to, you know, in Hillary Clinton's ad, the 3 a.m. phone call <laughs> kind of thing. Um, that does seem to matter. Right? And even in a polarized era, um, people still seem to care about either from the perspective of an establishment, <laughs> Trump perspective of the anti-establishment. I mean, I can say a few things about that. One thing I think is sort of fascinating, and I think the, I think my response somewhat cuts against the way you framed the question, but this is Gary wisely pointed out, we need to disagree some more on this panel. So um, I think that the Iraq war was an albatross around the necks of both parties the 2008 election were not that far removed from a, one of the rare elections where where foreign policy was quite salient in 2004 in 2008 it was something that obama used and you also see this on the republican side there's just a general sense of anti-incumbency um that you know there's a general sense of trying to move away from some of those problems and then in 2016 i think trump used the iraq war in a way that was was both sort of literal and about American exhaustion with foreign conflict, but was also symbolic. And I think that's really why, I think the Iraq war is distinct in this particular situation and has remained highly salient um, and thus is able to be used in elections, but also that it's sort of become, not to continue to flog my own work, but I wrote about this at 538 last week too, um, is gotten sort of incorporated into the culture war. Right, it's gotten sort of incorporated into questions about the war on terror, about about civil liberties, about culture, about masculinity, um, and that has given I think both parties something to and candidates like something to play with in their in their primaries, and then something to debate about in the general. So I think the Iraq War might be really distinct in this regard. Mm -hmm. I'd add one sentence. Um, I think if we look at Afghanistan. Um, Obama um, uh, created conditions of of a, of a certain a kind of uh, unfortunate exit um, by announcing we'll increase our troops, but only for a certain period. Uh, Trump, I think, did worse by um, the agreements he made with the Taliban, even an in invitation for a moment to Camp David. Um, uh, but it's what the public will remember is the disorderly end under Biden. Um, and uh, uh, the um, uh, I think no none of those three presidents comes away with honor in terms of how you end a twenty year commitment, um, but the the electoral price will be paid by the last by the last one, um, and and it's less because people know what they wanted in Afghanistan. I'm not even sure I know what I wanted quote in Afghanistan, but uh, but because of a sense of the honor of the United States and the way in which presidents are meant to guard um, fundamental principles and honor. And, and, and Biden wants to guard them as much as Trump or Obama, but the, the last days of the, the anti-Taliban um, regime were such that it'd be very hard to uh, come away from the, the imagery of that uh, desperate, terrible end. So to be the last word, um, I want to thank our panelists, Ira Katz-Nelson, Julia Zari, Gary Lawson, for their time, for their thoughtful comments. Thanks again to Ed Remus, uh, the librarian here at Northeastern Illinois, for organizing and making this happen uh, and getting the grant funding to make it happen, especially important uh, as part of our continuing series that he has put together on perspectives on the Constitution. Um, there's a survey for participants that's been put into the chat box. Uh, we ask if you could fill it out, if you could take a moment, uh, as that's helpful to us in, in thinking about future programming as well. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you to everyone for a, a really exciting, really wonderful conversation today.